to keep doing that. All right. So this is the Tide Capital Millionaire Podcast. This is episode 140. My name is Charles Oglesby, also known as Todd Millionaire, also known as Partner with Millie, also known as Todd Billy, founder and director of the Tide Capital Investment Club, founder and director of a lot of other great things that we've been doing for the people, doing for the community, seeing a lot of growth in the options community and that entire wave of people getting money in the stock market, which is great to see. Thank you all for tuning in. The purpose of this podcast is to share the stories of successful African-American business owners and investors so that people can hear the stories of successful examples. They do exist. We want people to learn that business and investing are the key to financial success and generational wealth. With us today, we have Brother Graham, also known as Marcus Graham. In fact, well, I'll ask you about that later, but he is a vending machine business owner. He's doing really, really dope things. He's scaled his business. He's grown his business. And he took a crazy risk on himself that paid off. And he's actually inspired a lot of people by what he's been doing lately. So I had to get him on the show so you guys can hear the great things he's doing and hopefully get a lot of information for yourself. So welcome to the show, man. Oh, uh, man, thank you. I appreciate you for having me on here. So the question we always start with is, what was life like growing up for you? Um... Wow, that's the first time someone asked me that. That's that's dope. Um, for me, it was you know it was tough. You know, like um, my mom doesn't you know she 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 looks for me to share this story because you know it's a part of her journey. Um, so you know I didn't have either my mother or my father for a while. Um, my father was in prison for murder, and my mother um, she was actually on drugs. So I didn't get to be around my mother till I was around ten years old. Um, I have a great aunt who, who raised me and my younger brother. Um, you know, it's five of us, but, you know, we were the youngest ones, so we went with someone who could, you know, take care of us because we were in, you know, school age. Um, got with my mom back at 10 years old. Um, she met an uh, amazing man uh, who became my stepfather, who became my father, who um, is, you know, one of the reasons I am who I am today. Um, yeah, you know, we, we struggled a lot. We struggled a lot. Um, there were a lot of tough things, which kind of made me tough, which kind of made me persevere, which, you know, which made me, you know, want to be better than the situation I was in. Um, so, yeah, that was, that was kind of, you know, you know, where I, where I come from. Yeah. When did you first get that, that itch to get into entrepreneurship? Um, man, you know, what's crazy is, um, I was, I think I was 16. I was in high school. Um, and I had a friend, who's still my close friend to this day back at home in New York. Um, he was selling candy. He was selling candy. He told me he was selling candy for a basketball um, trip. And uh, I was like, oh, I can help you do that. And, you know, because I was very personable. So people liked me in school, so I was selling it. Uh, Cut to find out he wasn't selling it for no basketball trip or nothing like that. He would just <laughs> he just used it as an excuse to make money. Uh, but then, you know, we ended up, you know, partnering. So I would get a percentage for selling the candy because I had – you know, he would put the money up and I had the, you know, personality, you know, cause I didn't, honestly, I was poor. I didn't have no money at all at that time. Um, and then I did really well with that. Um, so my senior year came, I became, you know, senior class president and we needed to find a way to fundraise a trip to, you know, to Universal Studios. And I thought, hey, let's sell this candy, man. You know, so I would go, you know, we would go to Sam's Club. Back then it was $4 for candy. It was 30 in there. And I was able to get the whole class to sell that and, you know, be able to pay for our trip. And I was using, and I had a lot of money, you know, to, um, to for myself, you know, like, what is it? If it's, let me see, $12 a box, I would sell two boxes a day. That was 60, you know, pieces of candy sold, $24 put in there. That was $36 profit, which ended up being $180 profit for Friday, Monday through Friday. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was paying for my clothes. I was paying for jewelry because my, my parents didn't have it. But that's how I made money. And uh, mm -hmm. fast forward, I had a friend. Um, you guys probably know him. Um, his name, you know, Kashif Edwards from the Vending Biz. And he, you know, we talked a lot about that. We went to school together and college together. And, you know, he first came with the vending machine business. Um, I was looking to do real estate. And he was like, yo, let's come out this way to come out to Philly. You know, let's do some. You know, some let's do some real estate together. He was like, hey man, just get a couple of vending machines to set you up. Uh, so it was just supposed to be a little side hustle for me until I, you know, scale, you know, until I get to the real estate business. And then it just kind of just took off on its own. So 
let's talk about that deal. Let's talk about your, well, man, let's talk about the deal, but let's also talk about kind of what set that up. Cause I know you said like you were in a situation where you had to make a decision, like either I'm going to spend this money on this or I'm going to spend this money on the business. So you yeah. tell us that whole story there. Okay. So I, um, I have a four year old son who I have joint custody with, with the, with the, you know, previous woman. And it was, when I moved to Philadelphia, it was some stuff going on to where it made it tougher for me to be able to, you know, get in contact with my son as much as I would like to. Um, so what I had to do is, you know, I was going to get a lawyer, you know, because um, unfortunately as a black man going into court, sometimes you're not giving the, you're not giving the requisite respect that you deserve in a sense. Um, but at the same time that I was looking to pay for a lawyer, I had a vending route come up. So that's all the money I had was enough to pay for this lawyer or pay for the vending route. And, you know, I talked to some of the closest people around me and, you know, I believed in myself and I'm like, you know, I'm a, I know I'm a great father. I know my son loves me very much. And I know that I live my life the right way. So the right thing is going to happen for me. And I know that if I invest this money into the, you know, this route, I'm going to be able to do so much more for my son by having this set up, you know, um, that was always my goal. You know, I moved to Philadelphia because I knew it was more opportunities here than it was in the small city where I was from. So I had to sleep on it. Like I really had to think about it. And it's like, man, but if I get this route, it's going to change me and my son's life. And I believed in myself. Like, I know I'm going to go into that, that, you know, that case and I'm going to, I'm going to fight it and I'm going to win. And, you know, and I paid the money for the route. And when I went to court, um, I even never had to make it to court because everything worked out right before we even got into it. We sat down, we talked, and we was like, everything is good. Everything's been great since. Um, and that was the biggest thing that kind of happened to really help propel me in business. And as you guys can see, you know, if you look on my social media, that's also my son who's helping me stock the machine sometimes yeah. and trying to take little notes and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what happened. So can we talk about the acquisition? How did you find that vending machine route? So uh, I have a close relationship with a vending warehouse. So this vending warehouse, what they do sometimes is um, they, you know, they buy, they buy a bunch of accounts and sometimes they might sell off smaller accounts to individuals like myself who are, you know, we're pretty close with them. We have a great relationship with them. I buy machines from them. I buy product for them. I might pay for the, you know, pay them to move delivery, like do things like that with machines. So we grew, we built up a great rapport. So they might be like, hey, we got these routes coming up, you know, and um, they're not too profitable for us because we're a big, you know, we're a bigger business, but it's going to be very profitable for you as a smaller business, um, as a one, you know, man business. So, you know, they came to us, um, me and um, one of my, my friends, my partner, we, um, it, was, it was a 15 machine route. And I was already in the business. I had two machines, uh, but my partner, he didn't have any machines. That's how he got into it. So what we did was we put money together and split the machines kind of down the middle. I got eight, he got seven. Um, and that's kind of how, you know, we got those routes. Okay. So the first two machines that you had, were those, were those performing pretty well? Not initially, you know, um, like I tell everybody, you know, in my course and everything, like I made, I was making like $60 a month for like the first three or four months. Um, because when, when you have a new, sometimes we have a new location and may, A, it might take a little while for it to build up steam because they got to get used to it. And B, I was replacing a previous um, vending company. So sometimes when that happens, they don't use the machine that much, you know, because for one, it might not be a great location or two, the person that ran that location wasn't really good at it. Like sometimes people just don't do a good job at what they do. So mm -hmm. I had to build up the credibility. And, you know, by month four is when I started to make some profit at the location. But I ain't gonna lie, those first three, four months, I was, I was at those machines taking care of it. Like I was making $1,000 a profit, you know, because mm -hmm. I was just happy that it was mine. And I knew, you know, the vision, like, man, I took that leap of faith, so... I know that this is going to be something. Like I got past the initial, you know, tough phase of investing, you know, being scared to invest. I'm like, now I know what this is about to do. So what did you do different to increase the sales at those locations? Um, 
what I can, what I do is I, first of all, pay attention to what's being sold, what's not sold, test out different items. Um, mm. I do this one trick specifically in places like business offices or small places. Uh, I'll put a scratch off on the back of some of the product. So that way that creates buzz within the building because it's typically with people who are older, they're going to communicate. They're going to talk, say, Hey man, the snack, because the soda machines typically do well because you know, they, it's more, you know, they cost more, 175, $2, whatever. The snack machine is where you might have something that's 75 cent. So, you know, you might need a little more to generate buzz there. So we do that. I learned that trick from the vending biz. You know, he told me, you know, something that he did before, like he put a scratch off on the back. Uh, that's kind of something that stuck with me. Yeah, one, one thing that I'll tell people listening is when people who are successful tell you what they're doing to be successful, just do it. You might not understand why they're doing it, but I t- just do it. And I've experienced that in all different stuff. I know somebody was like, hey, put Takis in those machines and they're going to fly. And I did, and they've been flying like crazy. Some guy, he was like, what he said he does is he puts a dollar bill on the back of like one or a few different items. And then people buy it, they're just habitually going to just put it back in your machine anyway. So, yeah. (laughs) But they're going to talk to everyone like, yo, it was a dollar on the back. Now people are going to start going. But specifically scratch-offs do good because you a dollar, yes, they like, but you might, somebody might win five, ten, twenty-five dollars. So that that one specifically, like I have an apartment uh, building um, where it's seniors there, and that I mean I put that in there. It's a combo machine. They, they wipe out the snacks. They've been doing it ever since then because they yeah. never know when it's going to be there. That's true. So you talked about you just got a really good opportunity in a new location. Can you talk to us about that opportunity and how you found it and how you financed it and how you're going to position that to win? Uh, so I had two things happen. One of my big locations, uh, I put two more machines in there. So it's an 18 story building, 560 students in there. Um, and I initially had two machines in there, which did phenomenal. That's the machines that made me go viral. And then I put two more on the 10th floor and that does better than the two (laughs) that I initially put in. Uh, and the second one that, that you're talking about is they contacted me through my website. Uh, which is the number one way I get my locations that they come through my website. So they, you know, they look in the Philadelphia area. So I have that I service, mm-hmm. you know, Philadelphia, Delaware, Allentown, things like that. And they contacted me through my website. Um, my website, if you ever look at it, it's very, very professional. Um, and, you know, when they look, they, they have no idea that it's a, a one person business. They think that I run a major vending company. Um, and that's honestly how I get a lot of locations. Um, Cause not only do I look like that, when I go in there, I present myself and I take care of the machines. I take care of it as if I am a big business. I never, I'm never late with anything. Um, if there's a service call, I'm there quickly. Um, if there's a problem with the machine, it's fixed quickly. So uh, that's kind of you know, how I get all of my stuff. Um, so I've, I've had this experience before when you show up to locations, do you tell them that you own the business or do you tell them, what do you tell them? Sometimes if they ask specifically, yes. Most times, no, no. Mm-hmm. Um, but sometimes I do, but most times as I continue to grow and sometimes it's better to just be like, man, I'm just here to fill it because you might get a million questions, a million this, a million stuff. And like, sometimes it's like, let me just come in here and do what I got to do, man. Yeah. Uh, so, man. <laughs> it's kind of like that, that real estate principle of being the, the property manager, not the owner. It's like, yeah. I, I didn't manage the property. I got to take that up with the big boss. I see what he says. <laughs> yeah, that's how I do. So that's why I stopped, I stopped wearing like a shirt and tie when I came to my meetings and I would come in with my polo and hat and stuff like that. So to me, they're like, oh, this guy works on the, you know, the vending machine. But when I work, you know, when I'm there, I... I, you know, I changed from being like the, the guy on the vending machine. So they know me on a first name basis because I'm talking to them. So now we cool and yeah. anything that ever goes wrong, they don't like, they don't even complain. They're like, oh, make it to it when you can because I, I built that rapport because I'm very nice. Like I said, I'm always on time. I'm always, you know, there when they call me, things like that. Yeah. The website, I see you talk about that a lot. Like, and what I'm realizing is it's, a lot of people think they have to be outbound marketing to get locations and get opportunities, but it seems like you just kind of create this brand and this presence and opportunities come to you. Correct. So I I tell everybody to use 
there's four ways. I tell them to use each four. Don't just stay connected to one. Man. Do cold calling because there's, there's businesses being built all the time. You know, like um, you might be driving and might see a construction under construction and hey, jot that number down, call them before anybody get a chance to do it. Um, yeah. Use a venue locator, you know, like if you don't have the time to place 200, 300 calls, spend 200, 300 dollars for them to try to find your location. Um, buying routes, I mean, that's the the quickest way to grow your business, that's the closest thing to a guarantee in the business, especially if you do your due diligence and your website, you know, the branding, you know, a lot of times they're going to come to you a good amount of time. They're going to reach out to you. You, you know, you brand yourself. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I do it. I created a brand for myself that yeah. makes me look like I'm a major player um, in a, in a big city. And, yeah. you know, and I happen to be that because of that. I feel like, you you really cracked the code when you told people that, that you could buy routes. Nobody, uh, like, people just thought you buy a vending machine and you place it wherever you place it. But then you started telling people you could legit buy a whole business. So can you kind of yeah. break down what a route is for people? Because people hear me say route and they're like, what's the route? How do you find a route? How does that work? Yeah, so a route is pretty much um, buying vending machines that are already placed in locations. So when you have a route, you know, that's, a specific, you know, radius of, you know, where you have your locations at. So it's kind of like, you know, people in the real estate, it's kind of like buying rental property with tenants already in it. Right. So you're kind of coming to something where it's already making money. So you start making your money back faster. Now with vending machine routes, it's even better because you don't have to put as much money in. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to put as much money into it. Um, it's the closest thing to a guarantee in the business, you know, with the bookkeeping. And now that, you know, almost most machines have car readers now, you can check it on online portals. So you can kind of be in a great position to go from no machines to 10, 15, 20 machines fast. Like I said, my, my partner, he had no machines and he got seven. Um, and, you know, that's kind of how you can grow fast. Like I bought, since I've been in the business, I bought two routes. Um, and the first route I bought, it was a, it won't mean it's a still of a route, you know, they sold us 15 machines that were already placed in locations for $7,000. So I put up 35, my partner put up 35. His locations were overall were better than mine. But what I did was I sold two of the locations, which have four machines in respectively. So let's say, so I sold that for 2,500. So I bought eight machines in locations for 35. Sold four for twenty five hundred. So technically, I only paid two fifty for the other four machines. So mm -hmm. all of that is just pretty much profit because they're making a few hundred dollars a month. Um, you know, I said that was that was that was that was a great deal. <laughs> it's dope because you got the deal because you had the big money. Like you guys were able to buy it as a package, but then yeah. somebody else might not have a lot of money, but they have a little bit of money. So then you can kind of help them out. How do you value a route? How do you determine what a, a route is worth? Um, so typically you don't want to pay, you don't, I wouldn't pay more than what the yearly, you know, sales are. You know, when people sell routes, it's, you know, that's what the nature is. It's supposed to be the yearly sale is how much they sell it for or less. I always try to get it for less because I always try to get it with some profit, especially, um, especially in year one. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of um, you know nuances to it. Like I like if I have a, a route that's let's say it's three machines and it makes seven thousand dollars a year, that's that's cool, you know. But if it was five or six machines for seven thousand dollars a year, I would say no. You know I'm saying that's not enough. That's not enough there for you. That's not mm -hmm. too much there for you. You know, try to limit the amount of machines you have. Like if the I try to try to word this correctly, where the amount of money that you're going to make a year, you you know, you combine that with the amount of machines there will be, you know, making, so to, to make it simple, making $125 off of eight machines is, you know, saying isn't too, I wouldn't do that if I can make $300 off four machines, mm -hmm. you know, and sometimes routes you know people who sell routes will try to sell their whole thing together because they have they have some machines in there that's not performing well. Yeah. i always say listen i don't want those machines i want that i want those i want the ones that's doing well i always try to go with that that's um, dope. 
you know, I, I, I definitely make sure that when I go in there, you know, I see what all the prices is. Um, I want to know how long you had the business. Um, because if you are selling a, a route one year in, I have to assume that it might not be performing well. Right. You know, so if you're, you know, one year into it, if it, you know, you, who, you're not going to really sell it. Um, now, there is new, you know, situations where someone is moving away. Um, the route might be too far. They might have initially agreed to it because it's like, hey, I'm jumping on this. And then they're like, man, this is a little bit too far. Um, a lot of people sell routes because they're trying to get big lump sum of cash and get into real estate. Um, I mean, I know that one of the guys from the warehouse that I work with, um, he, he sold his whole, his whole vending business. Sold his everything. I mean, he had trucks. He had warehouses. He sold machines. He sold it all to get into real estate. Um, so, so. I mean, man, if you was around there, he sold about, man, he was selling machines for, <laughs> for like $400 that was worth $2,500. So that's how I got my, you know, my, my machines that went viral was that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I try to look for that. I try to look for things like, you know, especially soda machines. I always try to check, you know, the compressors and things like that because that's if that, that keeps the, the sodas cold. You know, you never want to get a machine where the compressor is bad, you know, or you know, a shoddy, things like that. Um, I always have to see the sales. I always have to see the sales. I create a bill of sales that state that this transaction is based on the numbers that are being provided. Um, anything, any inaccurate data will result in, you know, a civil suit um, because I try to protect myself. Most times if you present something like that, um, if they're not honest, they might not go forward with it. If they know you're serious about it. Sometimes they take advantage of people that's not knowledgeable. Um, me, even if I even if I was knowledgeable, I just knew that I'm paying because of these numbers. If it ain't these numbers, then it's gonna be a problem. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, man, so you did have a post that went viral. I don't know if we actually broke down that viral tweet. Can we talk about that really quick? So in the viral tweet, um, I tweeted that I um, spent seventeen hundred for two machines. I uh, spent another six hundred for my card readers. Um, and a few more hundred dollars, like three, I think three, no, five hundred dollars for um, my product. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, I was making three thousand dollars a month on that location. So I got my money back all in that first month. And then everything wow. else after that was just booming and stuff like that. Um, and that's kind of how I went viral, which is still, I, you know, crazy to me because um, the night I tweeted that, you know, I had 90 followers. <laughs> and I tweeted that just because I was happy that I was just doing well, you know, like I got a phenomenal location. Um, and I just happened to tweet it. I, you know, I never expected nobody to see it because I never had nobody interact with me really on Twitter. And then it kind of just, just blew up, man. It just went crazy overnight. Um, I'm still trying to process it because it's a lot of stuff that came with it. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's how it was, you know. So I was just talking about how the startup cost for vending, you know, is a lot less than real estate, but you can make kind of the same amount of money per month. So I can make a thousand dollars a month off a, a vending machine or a vending location. And I can make a thousand dollars a month of rent with real estate, but I might've only put 15, 2000, you know, 2,500 into starting my, you know, vending business versus I have to put a lot more into the real estate. Now, obviously there's no equity within the vending machines, you know, so that's the trade off. But for me, yeah. I like the vending machine part because um, I deal with myself um, outside of middle aged women who might be like, oh, it's, you know, something happened. I typically, I don't have no, no issues. I don't have any problem with anyone. I have to deal with attitudes, emotion and things like that. Uh, I don't have to spend a lot of money to, to do this. Um, so that's kind of where I was, you know, coming from in my tweet that night. Yeah. What the reason why I like the vending machine business is, man, you could spend, 10 grand and you're going to bring in that thousand dollars a month on at minimum. And then what you were talking, he's like, you put car, car readers in there and the car readers are going to help you boost your sales. And so I've been finding locations where the current existing owner might not realize they could put car readers in there. Why is it that the current owners, they can be very set in their ways. They continue to put the same stacks snacks in there, even though they're not selling. They continue to not upgrade their, upgrade their electronics, even though they, if they did, they would increase their sales. They can be so boxed into what's just always worked for them. And that kind of creates opportunity for you. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely, man. I mean, this is a business that's been around for a long time. A lot of people have been grandfathered in. Um, I mean, to be honest, most of us didn't know we could own vending machines. You know, you yeah. go buy it every day, you use it, and you just never think that I can do this. You just probably just assume a big company owning it is cool, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, us coming in, like, I, like, I always put car readers on my machine unless I buy a route and it doesn't have any on there. And then I might take, you know, put it in there. I let the machine pay for the car readers. Right. That's one thing I do. I always let my, my business pay for the business. 100%. Um, but, you know, some of them, like I said, some of them have been operating for 10, 15 years. They don't know that they can update it or they don't feel like spending it. Um, honestly, I, I wish I could tell you why, but when when it comes time for me to you know to get some of these routes i'm like i'm looking at it like man oh, i put a car video on here because and you always want to gauge the, the locations too because um you know younger people they're going to use the car readers a lot you know whether it's apple pay whether it's your cards um older people less you know less because mm -hmm. they're still accustomed to using cash so mm -hmm. that can you know come into play um but just overall just adding car readers is just it does nothing but help the business. Yeah, yeah cause because it's like they can, they still have the option of using cash. Yeah, so, but specifically, you, the card readers is important for a soda machine because it's easier to have a dollar than it is maybe to spend have two twenty five, one seventy five. Right. So they use this. If you pay attention, the soda machines are always going to have more sales with the card readers. Um, hmm. So that's why I don't understand why they don't put the card readers on. Yeah. You know, but, yeah. I never thought about that. So what does it take to get card readers on? Because I know sometimes machines might not be card reader accessible, but apparently you can upgrade the mechanics in them to get them to be card reader accessible. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, some some machines um, you can, you know, they have, you can have the, the board updated. Now, obviously, I'm not really well-versed for being able to do that myself. I just would know if, you know, I just find out if, the, if it's, card reader accessible or not. Now, you know, some machines can be, have the board updated, where, you know, where it's just fine to, you know, to do it yourself. Well, kind of do it yourself. You know, you, mm -hmm. you know, you probably look at a tutorial, things like that. Um, but if it's not card reader accessible, what you'll need is a, a kit. That'll, that is a kit, you know, that'll allow the machine to, ex you know, accept card readers. And you can get that kit from a place called Vendors Exchange. That's where I got my kits from. Um, and that comes with, you know, the drill holes and things like that into the machines. Um, and with the kit, though, is because it's an old, because the machines are typically old, it might shift your keypads. So I had a situation where my keypads weren't wasn't functioning right. You know, I might press, let's say, A1, um, but it, it shows for A3. Like, you know, so what you have to do is you might have to get, you know, keypads from vendor exchange also. Uh, so you always want to be, you know, you know, wear that kind of thing. Um, when you get that kit, that that can kind of throw it off. Um, I had it, I had it happen for two machines, but one machine it didn't have, you know, two other machines it didn't have a problem with. Uh, so it's it's a kind of case by case kind of thing. But you just want to look out for that when you get that kit. So is, is vendor machine like a, a vendor exchange, like a website that you can go to? Yeah, yeah, they they have a lot of vending stuff there. You know, they like I said, you get the kids, you get the keypads, like anything you might need for vending machines. Um, you know, you can get that from there. Yeah, I need light bulbs. We bought the route, and like three or four locations don't have light bulbs. And Which, I, what kind of machines? Is it snack? Snack machines. Yeah, you I think get that from Home Depot. I, I think it's. That. That's good. That's good. News. I didn't know that. You go straight, go straight to Home Depot. You just, you just twist it out and put it in there and twist it in. Like now, check to make sure it might. It could be the bulb or it could be the piece. Um, I can't say the piece, but it's, it's a little small piece on the outside of the bulb. One, you can twist that off. That can mm -hmm. be bad. Fuse. It's a fuse. Mm -hmm. The fuse can be bad or the bulb can be bad. So mm -hmm. you check to see which one. But you can get, you can get it from like. Total like twelve dollars at Home Depot. I had to at my big my big route. Um, the bulb went out like a month in, so I just went to Home Depot, bought it in myself. Um, actually, I need to do a video on that. Yeah, it's 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 like presentation. If they yeah, can't, because, yeah, they can't. Not only, yeah, not only that, putting a new bulb in 
can make your machine look like it's brand new. Yeah. It don't matter what year it can be, but that brightness of the ball can make the machine look brand new. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's kind of fun. I feel like I was telling my mom one day, I was like, it's dope to be the CEO of the business because all the decisions rise and fall on you. Imagine if you're working for somebody else's vending machine business and you were like, hey, we could probably put some Hershey's cookies and cream in here and they probably sell. They'd be like, ah, we always been putting this in there, yeah. put them the Hershey's in there and just run it. But it gives you the ability to be your own boss and you don't got to spend a bunch of money to do it. So I think that's dope. Yeah, I, I love that part, man. Like that's, like I said, it, it, it's a lot of trial and error, you know, more trial, you know, but, you know, I'm always finding new stuff that they might like. Like I might, Run, run out of something, like something might be popping at another location. Mm -hmm. And I ran out of it here. Like for instance, uh, at my apartment complex with the seniors, um, I forgot what, I might've ran out of Cherry Pepsi. And I just needed to put something in there when I was stocking, like I didn't want it to be empty. So I put Tahiti Street. Now that Tahiti Street worked somewhere else. But I put Tahiti Street in there. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna be back here tomorrow anyway. And so I'm gonna just hold that on and then put in whatever was there. I came back the next day and all of it was gone. So I'm like, oh, <laughs> dang, they like to eat some treat. But now I know that, okay, they selling out the Cherry Pepsi and to eat some treat. Yeah. So whatever isn't selling as quick as that, I'm going to take that up. I'm yep. going to take that up. Exactly. 100%. I was finding it all the time. It's, it's valuable slot space. It doesn't yeah. <laughs> make sense to have that slot filled with something that could be selling with something that's not selling. Sure. So it's like, they don't want popcorn, we're pulling the popcorn out. We're going to put some cup of noodles in there or whatever. So it's fun. It's kind of like, it's always, you're always thinking, how you can how can you improve it? How can you do better? With the yeah. job, I don't know if the, that it, that's always the case. Sometimes with a job, you can be complacent, just showing up, doing what you got to do. But when you're in the business, you're just like, okay, this is dope. Now, how can we make this even better? Okay, this is dope. But how can we make it even better? So it's like a yeah. challenge. It, it, it pushes you to grow. What tips do you have for people who are looking to get into the business? Um, save, man. Save some money. Save some money. Um, however, you know, best you can do that. If you, you want to, like, I mean, before anything, man, you got to, like, you got to really want to do it. Um, that's, the, that's the number one thing, you know. You know, people... One thing I've noticed is that, you know, people always ask me a lot of questions and stuff like that. And it's, and it's always been easy to see who is going to follow up and not. You know, most of the people who, a lot of people just inquire, inquire. Yeah, I want to get it, but they inquire. But they, they don't really be serious about it. And which is, which is fine, you know, because that, you know, for the people that is serious, that leaves more opportunities for them. But you mm -hmm. got to get over the fear of spending that money, investing that money. That's the one thing to hold people back. When I was poor, when I was poor, I had $10,000. And I was like, man, I'm really about to put this money into this business and I have no guarantee. Like, people want guarantee. And mm -hmm. you can't guarantee anything. But I just knew for myself that, man, I knew playing the safe has kept me poor. So the worst thing I can do is lose this money investing and end up what, being poor again? I already know what it's like to be poor. I've been living, I've been fine with it, so, but I don't know what it's like to have money. So I know that this right here might give me that opportunity. Right. And you gotta really be willing to invest and get past the fear of it. You know, um, save your money. You save your money because, like I said, routes is the quickest way you can grow in this business. And you wanna be able to have that money when it happens. You wanna be able to have that money when the opportunity comes. You might get, especially the time like this, you know how many people are going to be selling routes right now for cheap because they just need a quick lump sum of cash? You know, save your money. If you can, save your money. Create a brand for yourself, you know? Create a brand for yourself. Like, let people see that you are a business, you know? Like, I don't just, you know, create websites for people just to make money. I'm telling people, like, listen, this is exactly what happened for me. You know, I created my website. I had it. People go there and look at it. They trust it because... It looks like a legit business. I mean, if you're going to buy something, you're going to go with the thing that looked like, okay, you're you going to Google. You're going to Google and look and see how legit it is. If it looks legit, okay, I'm going to trust it. Now, you don't know who behind it or nothing, but it just looks legit. Present yourself like that. Be professional. Everything that I do with my business is professionalism. I come in with my, with my, my logo on my shirt, on my hat. I have my business proposal on the binder when I come in. 
Uh, like I said, I have my website. I have a phone service that's on my cell phone that when you call, you think you're calling um, a business office. Um, presentation, like that's very important. You need to have your presentation. Um, you need to be punctual. Everything, everything is very important, man. Follow up on your emails. One thing I've noticed with, I've been helping people with online. Like people don't respond to their emails. Everybody in business respond to their emails. You got to be on your emails, man. Like most of the people that you're going to be, the property management, the people who, you know, your place of contact, like that's going to be the person that, you know, you need to talk to. So they're going to be through email. Yep. So, you know, things of that nature, man. You want to um, utilize all kind of ways to, to get into business. Like I said, cold calling, try that. Have your website created. Use a venue locator. Try to get routes. And don't stop actively trying to be in the business. Keep You got to keep going on, man. Keep going on because there's new establishments built every single day. There's new, there's places that's been built for a long time. They got 100, 200 employees that don't have vending machines. And they just never thought about doing it. Or somebody, or the previous management said no. And now they got new management saying, no, we need to say it. Our guys is working hard. We need this. So keep actively looking. Keep actively searching. Keep actively promoting yourself. Don't stop. That's very important in this business. Um, and if you don't have enough money to buy a route, you should be around somebody who, who's like-minded like you and y'all put money together to do it. At some point in time, you, you can't be around people that's not on the same wave as you. You're not going to go anywhere. You're going to stay in the same spot. So if you can't afford to do it yourself, you should have somebody that can do it with you. Y'all put some money together. Y'all grind together. Um, and that's the best thing I can tell anybody. So before I wrap up on the last questions, you did have another viral tweet that I want to talk about. And it was the viral tweet about taking care of the mother of your child. Can you talk to us about that? Because I think it would be cool if you could expand on that for the people. Yeah, first of all, I didn't know that was going to go crazy, man. I <laughs> thought, like, I mean, listen, in my opinion, this is my own personal opinion. Um, if the mother of my child is fine, then my child is fine. Great. Yeah. You know, I, my personal belief is I, I, I'm doing great. I'm doing very well. And I refuse for when well, my child is with me to live one way and then go with his mom and live another way, lesser, when I can make that a consistent place. I want my, my kids to have a consistent life, which is great. Um, if my son's mother passed away giving birth to him, I will give any money, amount of money back to have her back here. So for me to feel like, oh, uh, you know, I'm not going to do it just because, it's just stupid. She could have lost her life. Um, to me, I mean, I live in the suburbs, you know, so my son goes to daycare and things like that. I got to pay a lot of money. Why not put that money over here and let him be with me or her at all times? Yeah. Why not, you know, help her, you know, you know, be in a position where she can be successful because at the end of the day, you know, we was, we was doing this thing together. You know, even though she never gave me any money to do it, we was rolling together. We was in college together. You know, we, you know, we, we was, you know, putting money together to buy McDonald's and stuff like that, you know. So for me to make it, for me to be successful, and for me to not keep up with my promises, I, I wouldn't be a man. And when we were together, I said, you know, I promise, hey, when we have a kid, I'm gonna do this, 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 and that. And I'm a man of my word, you know. And I just look at my kids and say, um, how can I look at them and want them to respect me as a man and want to be like me? if I can help change the person that they love situation, but I don't just because. Yeah. That's dope, man. I think it's dope. And I, I feel like sometimes you got to hear the noise and do it anyway. You got to <laughs> hear people talking. It's like, okay, okay. All right. <laughs> while, while you continue, <laughs> what you already decided what you're going to do. Cause people are trying to talk you out of what you decided to do. And they don't even have any context for why you're doing it. They don't know that you guys were back eating McDonald's. They don't know what your ultimate goal is. They're just like, all they hear is the numbers. And they're like, well, I wouldn't do that. Well, you ain't him. Yeah, you, you can't do him. it. You can't do it. Like, that's what it comes down to. You can't do it. Or you have women who, you know, they're, you know, insecure. And they think this. Like, man, listen. Like I said, I would never disrespect my son to treat his mother anything other than as a great woman. So we not, I don't have to be with her in order, you know, to, to be, you know, sleep with her, do all that kind of stuff. I ain't, come on, man. I'm not, like. When I look at my son, I want my son to be proud that I'm his father, first yeah. and foremost. And he loves his mom <laughs> to death. 
You know what I'm saying? So that's when, it's just like my homie, like, hey, that's your man? That's my man. I'm going to look out for him. So when I look at my son, like, that's your mom? That's who you love? All right, she go with me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know how it should be anything other than that. What, what part of New York are you from, man? I'm from Rochester, New York. So I'm like an hour and a half from Buffalo. Hour from oh. Buffalo. So five and a half hours. It's crazy. I'm six hours away from New York. No, I'm six hours away from Brooklyn. I used to live in Brooklyn. Um, but I'm, five, I'm closer to Philly than I am New York, which is weird. Okay. That is weird. Uh, last few questions is who is somebody that you look up to and why? Um, who is somebody I look up to? My grandfather. So my grandfather, um, his grandparents were slaves. So they're in South Carolina. So my grandfather, he, you know, he worked on that plantation where his family was slaves, where my family was slaves. And he moved to Rochester, New York when he was 17 years old. He couldn't read, he couldn't write because he didn't go to school. He started working at General Motors, um, but they told him that you know he couldn't he couldn't work there if he didn't learn how to read and write. So he you know he went to night school, learned how to read and write. Write um, by the time he was 21, um, he was very successful. He ended up getting into the real estate business, and then he had a really really big house built back down south. So he always said that he wanted to move down south and come back better, way better than when he left. Um, so watching you know somebody who I've known slaves, they know slaves that were close to them to work on the plantation, to become successful uh, with, you know, against all odds. As somebody I just, that's my best friend, you know, I'm, I'm inspired by him. Um, he always tell me that um, anything that I can, that he can do, that I'm going to do a hundred times better. You know, he saw things for me before I saw it, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm, I just went to visit him two weeks ago back in South Carolina and we just, happy to be able to, you know, show him that I made it, you know, because he told me he, you know, I was going to do it. Um, that's one person for sure. Are you said two people? Oh, uh, no, just one, unless you just have one another one. Yeah, him, without a doubt. All right, cool. What is your favorite business book? Favorite business book? Um, shoot. Was it Think and Grow Rich? I like Learned it. that one. Think and Grow like Rich. It. That works. Um, what sets apart successful people from those who give up, fail, or never get started? Successful people in the vending machine business. Um, successful people in the vending machine business, um, man, they just, you know, diligent, man, diligent. You know, like, it's, it's not easy to find, you know, great locations, you know. Sometimes it's hard to find a location. Um, but those of us who continue at it don't make excuses like we we don't make excuses that's the one thing you know the first thing that people say is like all the locations are taken away or stuff like that man we don't think about none of that we're thinking about this 19,000 cities in america this business <laughs> there's been a machine location available that's how we think in that in that way we don't think about the negative part we're thinking about um damn where can i find one versus is there any more yep 100 percent so, great interview. I think we covered everything. My last question is always, where can people find out what you have going on? Where can they follow you? Where can they support what you have going on? Where can they get uh, contact you about getting a website? And where can they check out your course? Uh, yeah, so you can follow me on Twitter, at Brother Graham. Um, and you can follow me on Instagram at I am brother underscore Graham. And those are the two places that I, you know, I operate the most, that I you know, connect with everyone. Um, you can go to my website. You can take a look at it if you want to see what a vending machine website should look like. That's at www.joiner, J-O-Y-N-E-R, vending.com. Um, and I'm working on a new site uh, with my own domain, which will be marcusgram.com. That's becoming very soon. That'll be your one-stop shop for all your vending information. Um, two questions. Why Joiner Vendor and why Brother Graham? Uh, joining, joiner vending. Uh, my grandfather is John Joiner, and I, I wanted to make, I want our, you know, the the name to be a big family brand, and I wanted it to be everywhere. Honestly, I wanted to pay homage to the man that kind of, um, you know, who you know who set the tone for what it is to one, you know, to be a great man, to be a successful man, um, and want to take care of his family. You know, so I wanted 
create that for my family and allow them the space to be able to not have to work for everyone. I mean, I'm not at that space yet, but it's, it's happening. <laughs> it's happening. And Brother Graham is because uh, when I talk to everyone, um, majority of my followers are from our community. And when they talk to me, I want them to feel like I'm their brother. So that's why I'm very transparent about everything. You're able to watch all of my success happen in real time. Um, I'm always accessible. I'm always trying to help. Uh, you know, I've gone, done a couple, you know, giveaways. Um, so I want everyone to feel like I'm their family because at the end of the day, we are. And the more that we, I help people, the more that they can get to a place where they can help people. And if we keep doing all of that, that's how we're going to create a better community. Facts. I definitely feel like you're my brother. It's so crazy. I feel like you gave me the ability and the confidence to buy that route because I asked you, I was like, hey, you think this deal makes sense? And you're like, I think it makes sense. And so I was like, cool. So we did it. But like, if I didn't have that backstop, if I didn't know somebody already in the space, already in the business to ask that question to and actually get a response, not get left on scene or not yeah. get left on red or something like that, I might have still been where I was maybe three months ago, which was still yeah. in a dope spot. But <laughs> I like being in business. It's cool. It's cool. Yeah, man. I love it, man. I'm, um, and I try to, I try to respond to everyone as much as I can. When I go viral, I be getting so many. It just be, it be tough, you know. Um, yeah. I, I try, I try to set a day to just start replying. But then after a while, it's like, man, man, this time don't pass too long. They probably don't forgot. Um, so <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm always happy to see everyone, you know, really apply it, man. Like that's the most important thing is being able to apply information man like and <clears throat> i'm always happy to assist with everyone's success and i don't i don't want nothing from nobody i want to see everybody succeed um, yeah. so i'm happy i was able to help you yeah cool so this is episode 140 my name is charles I'll always be awesome just top me in there check out all the dope stuff we have going on the options trading workshop also check out uh, gumroad.com backslash tie capital find us on instagram at tie.capital and partner with millie charles oglesby also, this time in there, signing off. Fun. Dope, man. That was good. That was really good.